Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Hi everybody. Today um, about a new topic in ICU practice, acute pancreatitis management in ICU. So what are the famous causes of acute pancreatitis? The two common causes, alcohol and bile stones. And there are other causes like medications, other cyprene or diuretics, post-ERCB, hypertriglyceridemia, infections like cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus or mumps. But alcohol and the bile stones are all of the most common two causes of acute pancreatitis ever. How to diagnose acute pancreatitis? It depends on detection of two of three. First, abdominal pain, which is suggestive for pancreatitis, which is severe epigastric pain referred to the back. Second, high amylase and lipase levels and should be above three times upper limit of the normal range. And third is imaging evidence of pancreatitis, usually by CT abdomen. <clears throat> so if we got two of those three, we have a diagnosis of pancreatitis. What are the complications, possible complications of pancreatitis? We can divide them into local complications like pancreatic necrosis, pancreatic pseudocyst, bury pancreatic collection, or systemic or major organ failure like ARDS, shock, AKI, high liver enzymes, alias, abdominal compartment syndrome, and DIC. And the usual trigger behind all of these complications is severe SERS, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. These are images for some complications mentioned. So this is a very pancreatic collection, which is early complication and usually resolve spontaneously. But this one is the pancreatic pseudocyst. Quite late complications might need about one month at least to happen. And it usually needs surgical intervention for drainage, possibly percutaneously or endoscopically or classic surgical techniques to deal with the pseudocyst. So now let's start with discussing investigations we need to do to confirm the diagnosis of pancreatitis. Bloods. We need to do amylase and lipase, as we mentioned before, should be above three times the upper limit of normal range. And uh, it's very well known that amylase is not specific for pancreatitis. Lipase is specific. We need to do full blood, CBC, kidney functions, liver functions, calcium, albumin, ABGs, and we need those investigations mainly for prognostication and risk stratification rather than diagnosing pancreatitis. Second item is imaging, and we need to do abdominal ultrasound, which might be very useful in detecting gallstones and dilated common bile duct. The other modality is CT abdomen. CT abdomen uh, could be done early to confirm the diagnosis if the diagnosis is suspected. If we don't, if, if we have suggestive pain with no high enzymes, for example, that time we need to do CT early to confirm the diagnosis and rule out other complication. But if the diagnosis is clear, usually we reserve doing CT abdomen after three days. Uh, and the idea behind that is just give a chance for complication to happen. So not to underestimate the picture and the severity if you do CT very early. And most commonly, 85% of patients we detect interstitial edema, 15% we might detect pancreatic necrosis. Let's see 
those examples. So this is normal pancreatic tissue. So this is air fluid level inside the stomach. Behind the stomach immediately, retroperitoneal organ in the pancreas. This is normal. Here, if we compare this tissue with this tissue, this one is very swollen. This is interstitial edema in acute pancreatitis. If you can see black pancreatic tissue like this, with decreased enhancement with IV contrast, it's not enhanced at all. This is pancreatic necrosis. So this is normal. Swollen pancreas, interstitial edema, and pancreas with non-enhancement. This is pancreatic necrosis. Next step after doing investigation, confirming the diagnosis, we need to classify the patient. This is very important. We need to know whether the patient is mild or moderate or severe. There are many, many scoring uh, systems developed for pancreatitis, like revised Atlanta criteria, like Ranson criteria, like Glasgow criteria. But this is extremely important, at least to know which patient is suitable for ICU admission. So according to revised Atlanta criteria, we can classify patients into mild, moderate, severe. Mild, if there is no complication at all, no local complication or systemic complication or organ failure. The patient is going to be moderate if he has one of them, either local complication or organ failure complication, but for transient period, less than 48 hours. So AKI and resolves quickly. The patient is recognized as severe pancreatitis. This is our patient in ICU. If the patient has positive persistent organ failure, meaning by persistent should be longer than 48 hours. So this is severe pancreatitis. We have also other scoring systems like Ranson score, very famous one, and the Glasgow Emory score. So this is Ranson, and as you can see, as you see, some points can be done at admission, and the other points should be done after 48 hours of the admission. And I consider this maybe the, the negative drawback for using Ranson criteria. I need quite early classifying the scoring system, not one which should be used after 48 hours. But anyway, it depends on the age, white blood cells, glucose, AST, LDH, respiratory function, calcium, renal function. Yeah. And every one it takes single point. So we have 11 points. And this is the scoring and the corresponding mortality as mentioned here. Glasgow Emory score is good that you can use it at admission. Similar factors and you can use it at admission. So three or more is considered severe attack need ICU admission. So don't exhaust yourself to memorize them. Just download this great app, MDCalc, and put your points in, and the app will tell you everything, whether this patient is mild or moderate or severe, and go ahead. Let's now discuss the important part, management. First of all, A, B, C is always our first step in managing ICU patients. So if the patient has respiratory compromisation, ARDS, respiratory failure as a complication of pancreatitis, we need to intubate and ventilate the patient. And of course, we will deal with him as if we are dealing with any ARDS patient. Lung protective ventilation, very low tidal volume, 6 ml per kg, ideal body weight, like any ARDS patient. 
than the cardiovascular support C. For this, we need fluid resuscitation. This patient has deficient intake, vomiting, maybe diarrhea, plus vasodilatation and fluid sequestration in the third space due to the inflammatory process ongoing. That's why this patient is very, very, very hypovolemic and the fluid resuscitation is very important in our management here. And the, the usual practice was intensive and a very aggressive fluid loading between 500 ml to one liter every hour. But too much fluid is deleterious as too little fluid as well. And we will discuss why. That's why American College of Gastroenterology recommends crystalloids by this rate. 250 to 500 ml per hour in the first 12 to 24 hour only. Why not continue like this? Because aggressive, it, it was discovered that aggressive fluid resuscitation carries increased risk of increased need for mechanical ventilation and the possibility of abdominal hypertension or, or abdominal compartment syndrome. So we need to balance this. We don't need to give aggressive fluid resuscitation any longer. So we might need to do this in the first 12 to 24 hours only. After that, we might continue with the policy of conservative fluid management like any septic patient, just to maintain the urine output 0.5 ml per kg per hour and normal lactate level. That's it. That's all about fluid resuscitation. Very updated data. Of course, we have the vasopressor support. We can use NORAD, noradrenaline to keep main arterial pressure above 65 millimeter mercury. Um, and using vasopressors may limit the aggressive fluid resuscitation. This is a good point. <coughs> Then we'll move to the specific treatment. What about the antibiotics? Should I use antibiotics routinely in every pancreatitis patient? The answer is no. Pancreatitis on its own is inflammatory process. So routine use is not recommended. So only use antibiotics if there is clear evidence of infection, like gas in the CT abdomen or positive microscopic culture of fine needle aspiration sample from a very pancreatic fluid collection, for example. And in this situation, carbapenem group is the best, imipenem, 500 mg, six hourly, uh, because of its good pancreatic penetration. But otherwise, it's not recommended to use antibiotics routinely in every pancreatitis patient. In Goldstone-induced pancreatitis, we might use ERCP. Should be done urgently to decompress the common bile duct and pancreatic duct. So if there is evidence of cholestasis or cholangitis or cholestone induced a severe attack of pancreatitis. Otherwise, don't do it. If the patient has cholestone induced mild pancreatitis, it's not indicated to do ERCB because in this scenario, inducing pancreatitis outweighs the benefit of pancreatic duct decompression. Now we have a clear view about using ERCB in Goldstone induced pancreatitis. Last step is fast hug. Feeding, analgesia, sedation, thrombo, prevention, head 45 degrees, ulcer prophylaxis, and the glucose control. And we'll start with feeding. The usual practice was to keep the patient nil per mouse to rest the gut and put him on TPN. It's no longer like this. Nil per mouse policy is no longer required. Mild pancreatitis patients can eat and drink soon, as tolerated. For moderate or severe patients in ICU, we can start with NG feed if tolerated. 
if NG nasogastric feed is unsuccessful for any reason, we might use NJ feeding, nasogestional feed. And if the enteral feeding is contraindicated or impossible, we might use TBN that time. And it's very usual to uh, use elemental or semi-elemental feed with those patients uh, due to the concept that elemental feed uh, doesn't stimulate the pancreatic secretion too much. Analgesia is a cornerstone in our management. Pancreatitis is a very painful condition and we need to give effective analgesia for patients and uh, we uh, should use opioids or paracetamol should be used. But non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are absolutely contraindicated. Some patients might get benefit of patient-controlled analgesia to get effective control of pain. Thrombo prevention as usual. Glucose control. Uh, of course, hyperglycemia is one of the very well-recognized complications, uh, but tight glycemic control is not recommended. Just maintain glucose around 10 millimole per liter. That's all you need to do. Thank you.